Okay. So I'm here today to give a two and a half hour talk. So if everyone wants to just settle in. Um, no, um, very much like uh, Bob, I've had to cut this down to just a very narrow section of this entire idea. Um, a couple of ground rules. Oh, is first of all, put in your uh, slider. All right. Um, ground rules. If there's any questions at the end of this, uh, feel free to find me on Twitter or catch me over the next couple of days. Um, so Jess has already given you a, a good insight as to who Redacted Firm are, um, so I'm not going to go into that. I'm not here to sell us today. Um, a little bit about who I am, so you know who I am. Um, I've been doing cybersecurity now for 20 mumble years. I've been doing it since I was a little kid. I've been doing it professionally for like 25, something like that. Um, I was a former head of social engineering and physical assessments in some places. I've been a head of uh, penetration testing in a couple of places. I've been the head of cyber research for Raytheon, which is a massive defense firm. Um, and now I do this. Um, but as you all saw earlier, Jess did a fine who am I introduction. So I'm going to do my, my version of this and hope it goes just as well. So I am one of these. An ethical one, I might add. Um, I am not one of these. I'm not one of these. I'm not one of these. I'm an old school one of these, and I've been doing it since I was a little kid. At least I was until these guys did this. Um, after a while, all the charges were dropped, and I gained my freedom. And I went on to work for these guys, these guys, these guys, and these guys, always going dressed like this. Um, on Fridays, just like Jess, I do dress down. Um, <clears throat> Nowadays, I often go looking like this, um, and when I'm not doing this, I love doing stuff like this, which is outreach stuff, a lot of media events, uh, lots of talking at conferences. Um, when I'm not doing that, I will be found doing this. Um, I often do this, and I really enjoy doing this as a hobby, which comes in really handy when these guys do that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, by the way, don't break out of handcuffs if you do get handcuffed. They don't like that at all. Um, so I'm here to tell you about my job, and I have the best job in the world. Um, as Quinton would uh, describe me, I am a geek with James Bond fetishes. That sounds wrong out loud. Um, <laughs> um, but the difference is I actually do this stuff. I actually go and climb down lift shafts, have the night vision goggles on, the ski masks, kidnap people. I haven't kidnapped Chris, just in case anyone was worrying. Um, so pretty much everything I do in my day-to-day -day job is illegal unless I have permission to do so. And that's the key factor. I go out, I speak to the clients, they give me permission to do the, these certain things, and then I go off and do them. And that's to help your companies become more secure. So why am I picking on banks? It's not just banks that I rob. Um, you know, I've broken into thousands of sites across uh, the world, um, and a lot of them are banks, probably 700, something like that. Um, so a lot of banks, not just corporate banks, but high street banks as well. Um, the reason I'm picking on banks is because they're really secure. Who thinks a bank is really the best type of security you're, you're going to find physically? Yeah, a couple of people, right. We've seen throughout today that digital security in across all sectors is terrible. If you think digital security is bad, wait until you see how bad physical security is. And I'm hopefully going to show you some of the things that I've discovered in my journey over these years to help you guys go back, help secure your environment around you a little bit more and think of like the, the holistic security of your company. So the best way to think of any site, if you're trying to break into it, whether it's a bank or military complex or, or government site, uh, is think of an armadillo, right? They are hard and crunchy on the outside and soft and gooey in the middle, right? Uh, this is how all places work. If, if they've got a good perimeter, they don't care about the security inside. So you have to get past that secure perimeter, and then you can basically do whatever you want. And I'll show you some examples of that later. So the first thing is you need to secure your perimeter, right? This is utmost to everything. This stops so many of the attacks. What you don't want to do is build a glass house, right? You don't want to do this because I, as an attacker, can look through the window and see that there is no one at the reception desk. There is no security. There are no barriers. I can just walk into that building, and I already know most of the layout. This happens a lot. People think glass looks great. Well, it's not very secure, though. Um, and I mean this. Don't, don't, be sh don't be so open with your glass buildings. 
This is a building, um, and most of the most of the photos in this in this presentation, I have, I've actually taken whilst on assignment, whilst doing these tests. So this building in London has a, uh, a fantastic glass fronted uh, meeting room here, um, which is great. I stood outside this building for twenty minutes whilst I waited to take this photograph. The reason I had to wait was because they were having a meeting in this room, projecting on this wall all of their internal documentation. <laughs> Which I thought was a bit harsh to put in a presentation. So I was like, oh, I'll just wait until you guys have finished. And that took ages. Um, so don't, don't use glass as a perimeter thing. Um, sort out your fences. If you're going to build a fence, fences are really easy to climb over. Probably not a lot of people in here climb over fences regularly. Um, but fences are incredibly easy to get over. And if you're going to build a fence, don't put something like a light that I can stand on to get over the fence and make my life easier. Uh, it's just simple fence design, but people seem to fail at this. Um, and if you are going to put up a fence, and with cameras, um, you should watch everywhere. So again, terrible fence anyway, there's no barbed wire on it or anything. Um, but they've got two cameras, one pointing this way, one pointing that way. Don't care about that way, that's fine. No attacker's going to come from that way because we've got trees and stuff. Yeah, it, you've got to make sure that you're, you're positioning your CCTV correctly. And I see this done badly everywhere. In fact, I'm going to give you a quiz. Um, this is the back of a bank, a high street bank. Can anyone see the problem with this bank? Anyone? Yeah. Well, there, is a ca there, there is one CCTV camera, but it's protecting this really valuable tree. <laughs> uh, rather than this little doorway which I got in because it had a padlock and, well, padlocks aren't secure, are they? Um, and I see this all the time. People don't understand how CCTV works. They think, oh, if you just stick it up, it's going to stop attackers. It won't. Because, well, I'll, I'll, I'll spell this out. Proper placement prevents piss-poor protection. Right? Because, as you can see here, this is yet another plant that is being protected by CCTV. Um, and not only is it pointing at the wrong thing, it's about six foot, seven foot high, which means I can just move it wherever I want. Now, I, I ask you all to go out from, from this conference, go back wherever, and look around at the CCTV, and I can guarantee you'll see at least three or four examples of this when you walk down the street of CCTV just pointing somewhere it shouldn't, or not protecting something, or somewhere that you can reach it. They're terribly done, so sort out your CCTV. Most people don't even monitor it 24-7. It's generally just recorded and left. So you need to secure your entry points in this great perimeter that you've got. Um, this is something I also see, see failed a lot. For example, gates are worthless without fences. I'll let you, <laughs> let you take a moment. <laughs> um, but it's not just the fact that the fence is missing on this. They've completely missed the point of what a gate does. Um, for example, what this gate does is it provides a ladder built in. That's handy. Now I don't have to climb over a fence. I can just use the built-in ladder. But turnstile systems like this um, are really bad because of, again, people have just gone, oh, we've put a secure system in, a secure man-trapped gate. Attackers can't get in through that. I have walked through many of these by being incredibly inappropriate. And I'm talking like Harvey Weinstein inappropriate, right? So what you do, how to get through one of these is when someone is walking up to it and going through it with their credit card or not, RFID card or whatever, um, you run up to them and you run into them to the point where you are now both squeezed really tightly into one space that is meant for one person. And you get very close and they get very awkward. And the first thing they do is want to get away from you. They don't want to ask you who you are and why you're suddenly trying to get into their building. You're like, ah, sorry, I thought I, thought I was getting the next one. Sorry. And you just get through. And they don't care. So picking the right type of entryway is very important. And the, the closer they are, the more awkward it gets, believe me. <laughs> but you have to pick the right sort of gate. For example, expensive does not mean secure. And that accounts for everything in cybersecurity as well as digital, uh, physical security as well. Um, there's a great story I've got about a particular door like this. Uh, a company called us up and they said, oh, we've, we've just had all these like uh, social engineering tests, whatever. We failed. We've put in brand new doors. 
we've got this one door. It's like this one. It's not the photo of it. Um, and it costs us £60,000 to put this door in. This one door, 60 grand. And they're like, you'll never get in. It is super secure. So I'm like, okay, fine. So I climbed over a barbed wire fence through some bramble bushes, sat in a cold, half-filled ditch in the mud, balaclava on, night vision goggles, watching this damn door for three hours. It's like three in the morning. And I'm like, hmm, okay, I think I've got a way in. Yeah, so I climb, climb back over everything, go back to my hotel, put my suit on for the next morning, walk up to the site, and I'm like, okay, I hope this works. Got my suit on, I've got no kit, no RFID cloning kit or anything like that, just a watch. I look at it, slow my pace down a little bit, and just as I get to the door, it opens. Just, I, I just walk in, literally, just no problems. They're reviewing this afterwards, and they're like, the hell did you do that? Like, are you a Jedi? Did you just, like, will it open? I was like, no. When you guys put your £60,000 door in, you left it in engineering mode. And engineering mode means every 15 minutes, it does one rotation to make sure it's working. So, <laughs> so, so me sitting in a cold ditch for three hours meant I was able to time it perfectly and then time my steps up to the front door to let me in. That was quite hilarious. Um, so it's not just about how you, how you secure your, your gates. You've got to think about what's inside. Once you get past those gates, you've got reception. Now, there are all sorts of issues with a reception like this. A designer will say, oh, it's great, it's opening and welcoming, etc. Except, well, there's no barriers anywhere. Uh, this is the front door here. Uh, no barriers between me and the office. Um, there's no cameras. Uh, I'm able to stand in the office in the uh, reception area and take a photograph. That's a bit of a security concern. Also, we don't really care about security so much, we're going to build a desk so big the receptionist can't even look over it. So I'll just walk in and nobody will be able to see or care that I'm going through it. So how you plan your reception office is really, really important. Like It's almost for ev every entry point of your, your building. In fact, if you're going to do this, you need to put barriers in. And barriers need to barrier. The clue is in the name. <sighs> this is a bank. I'm not going to tell you which bank. Um, but they, they have this in their reception. Um, and, well, it doesn't do much, does it? Um, except when they randomly pull these little, like, rope barrier things in front of, like, to each side of it. And then put a security guard there. And they do this at a random time, like once a month or wherever. Um, that's fine, except, well, they've built a glass front door. So as an attacker, if I'm walking up to it, I can look through that glass, because that's how glass works, um, and see that the barriers are up and then just turn around and walk off. And so I'll just come back a day when they haven't got this barrier up and then just walk past their brilliant barrier. Um, so yeah, make sure you're doing barriers correctly if you are going to do them. And if you're going to do barriers, you should put security guards on them. But you have to remember that security guards are just people. Yeah, they get distracted. For example, this security guard is very distracted by the pretty receptionist. Um, in fact, he's so enamored with the pretty receptionist, he doesn't notice the person who shouldn't be there taking a photograph of him not doing his job, which is protecting the gate, which isn't doing its job, which I then walk through. I'll let you... Uh... <laughs> I'll let you just look at that image for a second and just say, how, how is security being done in that building? It's crazy. Um, but you also have to remember that security guards are not robots, right? So here's another funny story. I got into what is known as a dark site. Now, if anyone doesn't know what that is, that is a, a data center where nobody works. Yeah, there is a security guard, maybe two, and nobody else is ever supposed to go there. It's just banking details in server rooms that just sit there. Um, so I've talked my way in to said dark site, which I shouldn't be able to do. And I am now stood behind the security desk, which is a bad place to be. Um, this security guard here um, is intent on looking at the CCTV rather than watching me, the intruder, behind his desk taking a photograph of him whilst I rifle through his bag for stuff. Uh, and what he's actually really interested in is not me, He's interested in the lunch van that is about to turn up. So when the lunch van turns up, he asks me to look after things and then puts on his coat and goes through the double sets of metal barriers 
out onto the street to get a sandwich. And I'm thinking, do I lock you out of your building and go about my business, or is that a bit harsh? Um, so you just have to remember that security guards need feeding. They need toilet breaks. They don't just work like robots and just sit there all day. And once you get into these buildings, um, you have to secure the inside of them. Yeah, it's, it's all about what, what Bob was saying. You, know, you can't just have the outside being protected. It's, you have to think about your inside being uh, a threat vector as well. So once people are inside, there's all sorts of door control systems, etc. Um, for example, who has one of these in their office? <coughs> what, like one person? Come on, seriously, put your hands up. Right, okay, several people have this. Um, I can guarantee you it never looks like that apart from when it's brand new on day one. They all often look like this. <laughs> now, can anyone see the security issue with this? <laughs> yeah, you're probably all thinking, ah, oh, 1970, I could guess the go code, yeah. Well, what if they've... What if they've changed that? Yeah, they haven't bothered to buy a new one, they've just changed the code. The trouble is with this one is they've installed it with these brilliantly secure screws, which you could then just unscrew and then bypass the lock anyway. Um, but this, this, this is shown so much, like you, honestly, you can go around and look at any of these things um, and you'll see it all the time. And a friend of mine on Twitter, and I got permission to, to use his tweet, a friend of mine on Twitter um, said that they'd just upgraded to this pin code system in his company. And he posted some pictures. And this is it. <laughs> now, is, is that better security or is it worse? In fact, it, it takes less time to poke a, um, a piece of like a coat hanger through the door hole and press the exit button over there than it does to put in the pin and your card system. So it's a brilliant upgrade, isn't it? Um, and like I say, they only look like that on day one. Um, and what do these things control? They control magnetic locks. Who's seen these before? You see them everywhere. They've got them here in the hotel, you know. They're brilliant, except for they need power. And what I see more than almost anything else is people will put these on the wrong side of the door. <laughs> yeah. Now, the trouble is, and as you can see in these two, um, they're protecting data centers. Um, but it's on the wrong side, which means if I come along, I can just unbolt it or I can just cut the power and then it's no longer a lock. That's how they work. Um, and I've got literally th hundreds of images of locks on the wrong side of doors. In fact, if you go over to in our hotel, uh, if you go towards the, uh, the, the bedrooms, you'll see that there's a double door with mag locks on and they're on the wrong side. And not only that, after about 10 o'clock, they shut them off so they're just always open anyway because it's harder for tired people to open the door or something. <laughs> <laughs> it's bizarre. Um, but often you'll find that these doors aren't shut anyway. Um, these are two great images that show um, these doors haven't quite shut. And there was a, a client of ours that, that put in all of these uh, magnetic locks into their, into their site. Um, and the trouble is, um, I went around and I was like, it's great, but they don't shut because You've done this renovation, and part of that renovation is you've put in this really lovely, thick, new carpet, which means the door sort of drags along it and then just doesn't <laughs> shut. So it's pointless doing that. You've, you've got to think about shutting the door every now and again. It's, it's ridiculous. You shouldn't allow people to walk around your building. And when I do walk around buildings, and I do this a lot, is I will see a desk like this. Whose desk looks like this? Yeah, pretty much everyone's. Um, and there is a wealth, a wealth of security issues here. For example, leaving your desktop unlocked. If you do anything other than turn around in your chair, you should lock your desktop. Because it doesn't take long for someone like me walking around your office to compromise your machine. Um, paperwork everywhere I go. I see more and more paperwork, and it's always secure stuff. Uh, telephones, car keys. I used to take stuff... Uh, off of people's desks and their car keys, go into the car park and put all their stuff in their, their car just to mess with them a little bit, to like make a point, like I have taken all of your stuff. Um, but the biggest security concern in this photo for me is this guy here who's busy doing working. Rather than asking who the guy is that he doesn't know, that isn't wearing a badge, taking a photograph in his office. And this happens a lot. I break into a lot of buildings and I take a lot of photos. 
because it's evident, right? So how do you not get into one of my talks or one of my reports is you don't allow me into your office with a massive SLR camera, stand there taking photos, brazen as anything, of your insecurities, um, and then get this woman here who says, oh, are we, are we going to be in a brochure? <laughs> well, kind of. <laughs> so... So don't leave, don't leave your desktops unlocked and don't allow people to take photos if you don't know who they are. There was more to that story that was even more fail, but I'll leave that for another day. Um, if you have one of these, there is a reason it has a lock on the outside. You are supposed to lock up your keys um, to make them secure. If you're just leaving it like this, the culture in the company is saying, we don't care about security. We've got, it's just a nice place to keep all the keys. It's a key organizer, it's not a secure key locker. And I can guarantee you that's where all the good stuff is. So I had a really good uh, experience with one of these where I needed to get into a, a server room and I walked into the uh, security office and uh, there was no one there. So I opened up the cabinet, took all of the keys because I didn't want to sit there reading which one I needed, found the key I wanted, and then later on I walked back into the security office whilst there were security officers there and just put all the keys back. And they didn't ask me who I was, what I was doing with all the keys, or, or where I'd been. Um, so you have to empower your staff to like use these things properly. And I see this all the time. Um, some of the stuff I get asked to do is like, can you get to specific assets? Can you get to, for example, these four red folders that contain our absolute crown jewels? Yeah, And the answer is yes. <laughs> because what you've done is you've put them into a secure cabinet, which because you go into it fairly often, you've actually left unlocked and open. Um, so it's pretty obvious where they are. And because you haven't got one of those uh, nice key organizers, um, you've left all your other keys in there as well. So I'm going to take them and the files and then walk out of your building. And how people deal with secure documentation astounds me. How many people here deal with secure documents? Yeah, OK. How many people have one of? have one of these in their office. Similar things, right? Okay, so I'm not a particularly strong man, but do you think I could lift that bin up? Yes, I can. And why would I pick up that bin? Because it says it's confidential. So I will just pick it up and walk out. Same with the wheelie bin. I will just pick it up and wheel it out because nobody cares about the people dealing with that. You've put it in there, not your problem anymore. And what they tend to do is they take these bins down to the loading bay and they put them into these massive crates to get rid of them so they can get burned or shredded or whatever. Um, that's great because it just makes my job easier when I do this. And that's literally tons of very... I think it was, it was marked secret or classified, I can't remember. Um, but I got it out into the public car park and then I was like, oh, shit. Uh, I now have to break back into the building and give them their data back before someone steals it from me. <laughs> and believe me, breaking in with a trolley is much harder than just on your own. Um, another way not to handle secure data is stuff like this. Um, can anyone see the issue with this? Yeah, if you're a government department, you do not put your shredded paper out on the public street because someone like me that's testing your security will come along and just take those bags. And I'll take those ones because I know they're the important ones because they've been shredded. And then I'll take them back to my hotel and because I don't have many hobbies other than hacking is I'll put them back together again. And <laughs> then I'll have to redact out the information for a talk. But um, the point is, it, it's how you handle your data and not just thinking, oh, it's in the bin now, it's not my problem. You have to think about where it's going, how it's getting there, what's happening to that data all the time. And just shredding it like that is not secure. You should get it burnt. Um, and I was talking about how, how like, uh, when you get into these places, it is completely soft and squidgy, and you can do anything. I have spent many, many hours in many buildings that I didn't need to be in. Um, and you get very bored doing this sort of stuff. Um, so how many people here would get bored if they walked around their building for three hours, if you had nothing to do? Yeah, right. So I like to entertain myself a little bit by seeing how much weird stuff I can get away with before someone says, 
what are you doing and who are you? So for example, I like to join meetings. <laughs> <laughs> and you're thinking, wow, he must get really bored if he's joining meetings. But this was a particular brilliant meeting. Let's forget the fact that I have taken a photo during this meeting and nobody has said anything. Um, this meeting, I came across this one floor, um, and it's huge. There's like 100 people for this meeting. It's like, God, what the hell's going on? It must be something really important. And uh, there's a bald chap right at the very... Let's see if I can get this laser pointer right. It's about there. Sorry, I've just blinded everyone now. Um, bald chap in front uh, with a big telly, uh, and he's talking away. Uh, he's obviously very important. Turns out he's the CEO of the company. Uh, that I'm testing and uh, he doesn't know about the test and he's giving a a great meeting to the uh, the team there and he's saying about how they've done really well with security this year and they've had no breaches <laughs> so you've had no breaches and yet there is a man that shouldn't be there taking a photograph of your meeting so I do what any self-respecting ethical hacker does I text my client, who is sitting at the front of the, <laughs> of the meeting, and I text him and say, hey, I'm in your building. Uh, in fact, I'm in your meeting, LOL. <laughs> <laughs> to which I see him get his, uh, his mobile out, reads the message, face drains. He looks around, spots me, and I'm like, you all right? <laughs> and I'm just praying that there is a Q&A session at the end of this. <laughs> it's like... <laughs> Who am I and what am I doing? And is this a breach? Should we, like, should we rewrite your slides right now? <laughs> but when I say you can do anything, it's like not just you know, join meetings and whatnot. Um, I've done some really interesting stuff. And I got into a bit of trouble with uh, an ex-boss of mine because I posted this picture on Twitter and I shouldn't have done. Uh, it was for a government department um, and I got their finance team to build a teepee. Um, <laughs> Uh, as part of a team building exercise. Uh, they had no idea who I was, but it was great fun. We built a couple of teepees out of coats and stuff. It was fun. Um, I've built a bar and another one. Um, the best thing here was um, they got really friendly with me. And, um, you know, I went away and I told my client. And I always do a walk around with the clients, like, right, I got here, I got here. Um, when we walked into the finance department, he got told off because he wasn't allowed in the finance department, but they recognized me, and they were like, yeah, that's a great TP we built, and they showed him what we've been building, and it's like, you haven't got this culture right yet. Um, so if someone comes up to you and asks you to build a pyramid or a, like a, a TP or a bar, ask them who they really are, especially if they're not wearing a badge. And I want to finish up today with a couple of things that you guys can do to sort of take away, as well as all of this, it's a bit of fun. Um, but I want you to go away and hopefully enable your staff to do security. So if you've got one of those like key organizers, make sure that they're doing it correctly. If they haven't got one, get them one. Make sure they're able to do security in a way that helps your organization. Make security a priority. We've seen this several times today. It's always like the last thing that you'll add on. Like it's second place. It doesn't really matter. We'll just add it on at the end. You have to design your building to be secure, let alone end anything else. Because if you're, if you're building secure, then the culture in your company becomes more secure because of the way they're interacting with it all day. Um, keep a clear desk and lock your computer. Seriously. I have gotten so much information. I once got a, uh, I broke into a, a building, got up onto the CEO's uh, floor, and uh, I swiped a couple of letters. These letters happened to be firing them. The board had sent them letters saying, you are, f you are fired for insider trading. Um, I had to stop the test and go in and go, well, yeah, you really need this because this is really important and I shouldn't have sent it. Sorry. Um, so keeping it clear is quite important. Um, confront people. If you don't know how to confront someone, and people are really bad at this, people don't like confronting people that they don't know. So the best thing you can do is offer help. Say, can I help you? Are you here to see someone? Can I, can I take you to them? And if they start to get a little bit defensive, which they will if they're an attacker, start pressuring them a little bit more. Say, oh, I'll just call security to come and help you because I'm really busy. And that really puts them on the spot. Try and take an attacker's eye view on everything. This is how I see the world day to day, yeah, whether it's digital or physically. 
I will see flaws in all sorts of security, and it bugs the shit out of me. Um, but you guys, if you can go back and just start thinking, like, what would an attacker do? How, how would they compromise this? If people are really good at bypassing security because it's always in the way. So think about how they would do that and then figure out how to stop that. And last of all, seek advice. If you don't know what you're doing, you don't know how to do it, either speak to us or speak to someone else. I don't care who it is, but someone will be able to tell you how to do it better. So that's it from me. Thank you. I think you can go to the bar now unless there's any questions. Or applause. It doesn't matter. I'm happy. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yep. Yeah, okay, so the question was, does it matter how I dress when I go and do these things? And yes, that is a major, major thing. Um, you have to reflect the, the people that work in the office. Um, so I will do observations and say, okay, they're, they're wearing suits, they often wear like cornflower blue ties, shiny shoes, I'll do the same. If they're wearing expensive suits, I'll get an expensive suit. If they're just going dressed like this, I'll dress like this. I can change my appearance quite a bit. Um, and that helps tremendously. Sometimes you get it wrong. I once scoped out a building and they, they all wore business suits. I went in um, and I noticed that everyone was wearing onesies because they were having a charity day. And I was the only one in a suit. So I quickly left because uh, I don't own the onesie. Um, so it's very vital around that. And sometimes I'll use that to see how far I can get with stuff. So there was um, the, the very, very beginning um, slide I had um, where is it? Uh, this one here. Uh, oh, sorry. I'll show it to you. This one here um, was actually taken by a client of mine. Uh, as you can see, I don't have tattoos on my sleeve. That's a fake tattoo sleeve. Um, this was a site where they, they absolutely had to wear a suit all the time with a tie. It was very important. So the first day I, I broke in, I wore that suit and tie. And the second day I broke in, I wore slightly scuffier clothes. And in the end, on like the fourth day, I looked like that. As you can see, my hair's a mess and terrible t-shirt, ripped jeans, like the jeans are ripped to shreds, tattoo sleeve. I walked around that building and I still didn't get found. And this photo was the, the, the reaction from the client who, who took this photo and then emailed it to everyone and go, why the hell didn't you spot this guy? He stands out like a sore thumb, but you still let him around our building. So using the clothing is a, is a massive thing of showing how poor a security culture is. Any other questions? Yes? The most awkward situation I've ever found myself in. Um, that will be, uh, I was doing a set of high street banks. Um, I was doing like eight, eight or so every week. Um, so quite prolific number. Um, there was one particular area manager that didn't want it to happen. He was very against the whole testing. Um, so he, unbeknown to anyone, phoned all of his banks and told them that I was coming. Right, this, is, this is one of the two times that I've ever had a test go wrong. Yeah, um, I've thankfully never been caught apart from these two times. Um, but this guy, he, he phoned around and I went into the bank and they got really nervous because they didn't know what I was there to do. They just knew I was there to like steal money, but they didn't really understand it. So they panicked and they phoned the police. Rather than phoning, uh, like going through their procedures of everything, they just hit the panic button. So I'm sitting in reception waiting to speak to someone and uh, there's a guy beside me who's moaning about this bank uh, and you know the, they're, they're screwing him over on his mortgage and he's having a terrible time with it blah 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 and I'm like mm, I've been sitting here for 20 minutes uh, this isn't looking good I think something's going to go wrong suddenly armed police show up surround the bank run in and I'm like excuse me mate this is for me at which point he's like I thought I was having a bad day <laughs> so that was probably the, the most awkward but I, I managed to Talk, talk to them and say, Look, you know, this, this is my job, this is what I do, blah, 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 and, and got out of it. Um, another one was actually one, one of my very first jobs. Um, I was in London looking at a massive multinational bank, um, like proper bullion trading type. And uh, I was lost in the moment of looking at this horrendously secure building. And it was like two, three in the morning, something like that. 
and I'm standing there going, oh, jeez, I'm going to break into this place. And I hear someone behind me go, excuse me, mate, what are you up to? And I'm like, trying to work out how to break into this bank. <laughs> At which point I turn around and see the two police officers standing in the street. <laughs> the next hour and a half of my life explaining my job again. Um, so they're, they're probably the most awkward moments. Uh, there was another time I, I ran away from uh, some security. I, there's a lot of running involved in my job. Um, <laughs> it's taking its toll on my knees. I'm very good at r- jumping down staircases and over fences and such like. Um, but there's one time I, I ran away and I ran. Uh, he's seen Ferris Bueller. Yeah, yeah. You know that scene where he's like running through like the gardens and he stops and sees like the beautiful women like sunbathing? Well, there was a moment where I was running through these like garden, well, garden fence things, uh, jumping over these fences, yeah, and uh, suddenly there's a porno shoot happening in one of the gardens. <laughs> and I'm like, mm, uh, no, carry on, please. <laughs> <laughs> so, so they're about the most embarrassing moments of my, uh, my career. Any, any other questions? Um, it depends, really. It's um, yeah. It's sometimes head of security. Sometimes it's not head of security because they're the ones that need to be tested. So it'll be like the CEOs or or someone head of the the company will be like, okay, we need you to come in and test us. Um, and we've heard you're pretty good at this stuff. So come in, and test it. it. It does go wrong sometimes. I had uh, one test where um, the the head of security was very against me going in. He absolutely, he shouted at us during the, the, the beginning meetings. He was like, I don't want this happening. Um, he was really aggressive. And he said, if I, if I see you in my building, I'm going to tackle you to the ground. I play rugby. I'm going to knock you down. I'm going to sit on you until the police turn up and we're going to get you arrested. I don't give a shit about all these people. And it was like, okay, cool. So I broke into the building. Um, <laughs> And I found out where he sat, and I went up to his desk when he wasn't there. He'd sort of gone off for some meeting or something. And I sat down next to his mate, and I said, uh, can I borrow a bit of paper? So I got a post-it note, and I wrote, ha-ha, I sat at your desk. <laughs> and put it on his, uh, on his keyboard, and then left. Um, he wasn't very particularly happy in the uh, wash-up meeting, <laughs> let's put it that way. Uh, any others? Oh, wow, three, four, you. Uh, when you challenge, what do you if you ever get challenged, it's already a bit too late, um, so run away. If you see some sort of guard, um, the first thing you, you want to do is run. Um, how to get out of it depends entirely on the situation and where you are. If you are literally trying to get into a helicopter at the moment they turn up, don't try and pretend that you're a cleaner. Uh, pretend that you're there doing some maintenance or something. Um, so it's e- entirely dependent, and you have to think on your feet at any particular moment as someone going to turn up. But generally, don't try and get in that situation. Uh, saw another one. Yeah. No. Social, social engineering uh isn't really used in this very much at all. It's mostly just walking in, you know, being brazen about it. And just, you know, a lot of people put a lot of emphasis on social engineering. You know, I, I used to do a lot of social engineering. Um, I think that as a test nowadays is kind of dead. It doesn't really provide the client much um, in the way of security because of your, you're testing one particular <laughs> vector. Um, so any social engineering attack, um, or, or test nowadays will tell you that oh I, I I dressed up like a pizza boy and walked in through like the loading bay or, or got into the office. It won't tell you that all of your windows are secured by string, you know, or or that your fencing is terrible or that your CCTV camera doesn't cover everywhere. So s- social engineering is kind of a bit old school and we're trying to move into like the physical assessment side so we'll go in now and we'll we'll look at the entire site and say these are your security weaknesses across everything so social engineering doesn't really really happen anymore at least for us anyway Yeah, so um, this is this is one quarter of the entire talk about how I run banks, and that includes digital as well, and it, it often overlaps. And this is why Redacted works the way we do, is because security involves the human factors, the physical factors, and the digital stuff. And you, you can't 
tear them apart anymore. You have to test them all as one. And so we'll often drop assets into a company. So um, in, my, in my other slides, I have a, a phone that I show, and it's just a VoIP phone that I took apart and put in a Raspberry Pi with like an access point in it, and you just plug it in, and it still works as a VoIP phone, but it's now acting as a, a piggyback AP from the car park that I can attack your network. So often we'd break in, put something in, whether it's, it, it could also be people, we'd put people into offices as well, because the more people you get into an office, the easier it is to get more and more stuff in and out. Okay. Any more questions? One on the back. Uh, break down to successes and failures. Uh, hundred percent success. <laughs> <laughs> Apart from the two that went wrong because of clients screwed themselves over. So yeah, that's a, <laughs> it's, a, it's a nice easy break there. It does, however, put a lot of pressure on me when I'm <laughs> when I do these tests because it's like, is this going to be the one where I get shot? Um, so <laughs> thankfully not. So. Okay, so I think that's the last one. If, if anyone has any more questions, then catch me after this. Um, I'll be around for the next couple of days. But thank you very much.